I'm going to open with an interesting question. Do you ever think about how many of your strong beliefs might be wrong? This is a video about reasoning, and it is my belief that people aren't really taught how to reason effectively, so everything in this video is stuff that I came up with on my own, stuff that I figured out myself. No one taught me any of this, so I feel like people in general just aren't really taught how to reason effectively. And it's about like theorizing, about making predictions, and about explaining the things that you observe. And this is going to be more about how to verify and improve on any theories that you come up with or any patterns you recognize, any ideas you have not necessarily how to create those ideas or theories. And I believe this has many applications in our daily lives as well as in science and research and many other areas. So I'm going to start off with some key points. One big one is that an absolute statement, positive or negative, cannot be proven true with just examples. So if you say, uh, if you say something is true for all people, that's an absolute positive statement. Uh, if you just give some examples of it being true, that's not enough to prove it unless your examples somehow cover every possible case. But on the other hand, an absolute statement can be proven false with just a single example. So if you say, all people follow this rule. If you can find one example, one person who doesn't follow the rule, then the statement is false, and that's all you have to do. Now another point is that just because there are reasons for something to be true doesn't mean that's actually true. When you're testing something, testing out a theory, or when you're arguing a point, you want to support your ideas by considering where the statement is most likely wrong. That's underlined and italicized and in red because I believe that's really important. But I'll get more into that later. So, if you find somewhere where your theory is wrong, then you want to create a new theory that accounts for those flaws. And that doesn't mean you necessarily have to just throw away the old theory and forget about it. Usually you can build off things you learn from an old theory to create a new theory. You also want to be able to determine how confident you can be in how confident you can be that a certain statement is correct. So how I was saying you can't prove an absolute statement true with examples. If you give a whole bunch of examples of an exa of an absolute statement being true, can you believe it? Or should it still be questionable? That's something you want to be able to determine. And it's going to depend a lot on relevant factors. One, you're trying to come up with a theory or come up with an explanation for something or a pattern. You really want to find the answer of why. Why does it happen? What are the relevant factors? That's what you want to look for. I'm going to give some quick examples of how people can often just reason out something incorrectly. So, for example, if you are if you have a hobby and you beat everyone you play against in a game or something like that, and you use those positive examples to say you must be, like, one of the best at that game, that might not be true. It might just be because you're not playing against the strongest opponents or something like that. So even though there could be support for the idea, it doesn't mean the idea is true. There's another one. Maybe um, in the past in running, people could never run faster than four minutes. There are so many examples of people being unable to do it. So people started to come up with reasons why that wasn't possible, but it wasn't necessarily impossible. Just because there are reasons for it to look impossible 
doesn't mean it's actually impossible. Here's some more. Let's say you have a teaching method A, and it's more effective, like we've done a study, it shows that a higher percentage of students succeed from method A over method B. Now, should we just assume that method A is better for all students? Maybe not, because it might depend on the student. It might depend on some factor about the student, like maybe their gender, maybe there's more boys overall and the method A works better for boys, so it looks like method A is better overall, but really it's only better for boys. And if you knew why, you would be able to find a method that works best for 100% of people, not just some percentage. Some other ones are like, online poker is rigged because there's examples of it being rigged. <laughs> or someone is arrogant because you can find examples of them saying something that could be construed as arrogant, a lot of things like that. Now for some theoretical examples. The first one is going to be about boxes. So let's say you're theorizing about the contents of boxes. A whole bunch of like countless boxes. And you've opened some one trillion or some number of boxes and they all have the same medium square shape object inside. So we create a theory. All boxes in the entire world contain this medium square shape object. Is this a good theory? And can we be confident in it? Well, it's not a bad theory. There's nothing really wrong about it. And if we haven't seen any examples to um, show that's wrong, then there's nothing wrong with it, like I said, and uh, assuming we can't see any differences, any factors that we didn't consider, we can also be confident in it as well, just because we've opened so many boxes. That doesn't mean we can't be wrong, but it's a reasonable theory. Now let's take a very similar situation. We still have a countless number of boxes. We've still opened some like one trillion boxes and they've all had the same shape, but we only opened red boxes and not all boxes are red. Some of them are blue. So we now make a theory. All boxes contain medium square shapes like before. Is this a good theory? Again, it's not wrong, so it's not bad. It's a fine theory, but can we be confident in it? Mm, not so much, because we've never opened a blue box. It's possible that a different color box might have a different type of object in it. So, even though we've opened some like one trillion number or one <laughs> followed by so many zero numbers of boxes, if we only opened red boxes, we can't really be confident that our theory holds for all boxes because we didn't open any blue ones. So, it's a good theory, but we can't be confident in it yet. Let's continue with the examples. Let's say boxes come in different sizes, different shapes, different colors, but most of them are medium and red. Um, so which boxes do I want to open if I'm trying to create a theory about all boxes? Well, before I answer that, let's say I randomly open a large sample of boxes and 90% of the boxes contain a medium square shape. And I include, well, not all boxes contain a medium square shape for sure, but it's best to assume that they do because... 90% of them actually do. Is this a good theory? It's, it's okay, but it's assuming that all boxes should be considered the same. There are no factors that we can use about the box to get a better idea of its contents. So for that reason, if we can show that it is a good assumption, 
then we can be more confident in our theory. But can we do that? If we only test randomly, it's harder to show. So what we really want to do is open a wide variety of boxes and try to figure out what factors affect the results. What affects the contents, like does the size of the box seem to uh, cause the contents to be different? Or does the size relate to the contents at all? Does the color relate to the contents at all? Things like that. You want to do those you want to open boxes in a way that you can test those kinds of things. Now, for a very similar example, let's talk about people. People come in different sizes, different shapes, different genders, different personalities. Let's say I discover a method to treat a certain disease. And when I test on random people, it has the highest success rate of all known treatments. Is it good to conclude that this is the best treatment method for everyone? Maybe not. You want to think like this same box problem. Well, just because in a random test it has the highest success rate doesn't mean that it's going to work for every individual. So, if if I were a random person, and you couldn't know anything about me, then sure, this is probably the best treatment method, just because I'm a random person and you don't know anything about me. But I'm not a random person. I can tell you my height, my weight, my gender. You might be able to learn about my personality, all of these things. So given all that knowledge, you might be able to find a better treatment method for me as an individual. So just like the boxes, you want to theorize about what affects the results, not just come up with a large average. So I'm going to move on to a second theoretical example of points on a graph. So we have some unknown function, we put in a number, it spits out a different number. And we've run four tests so far on the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. The numbers that we got back were 2, 4, 6, and 8. So we predict the output is twice the input. Is this a good prediction, and how should we test it? Well, again, there's nothing wrong with a prediction like this. It's perfectly good. It matches the data exactly that we have so far. Now how should we test it? How should we test it? Well, what we wouldn't want to do is test numbers that we believe are going to fit the pattern. So we wouldn't want to, want to test numbers like 5, 6, and 7 most likely, unless we had some special reason to believe those might be different. We wouldn't want to test those kinds of numbers. Instead, we would want to test numbers like 100 million, negative 1, negative 100 million, pi, 0 0.0001. Those would be good tests, because those are tests considering other factors. Those are tests that consider where we might be wrong. So, in our original four-number test, we didn't test any large numbers. So, we might want to test some kind of large number. We haven't tested any negative numbers. We might want to test some negative numbers. We haven't tested any fractions or any decimals or any irrational numbers. All of these might be factors that affect the result that we haven't considered, so we want to test them. For example, maybe when we do fractions we find out it actually looks more like this. So here's one, here's two, here's three but in between it kind of goes up and down. So maybe, even though if we do whole numbers it looks like a straight line, it's actually more like a sine curve that's going up. Or maybe something else we find is we start doing really large numbers and we're getting num values that are lower than we originally expected. So, like, maybe way over here, it looks like a straight line, 
but as you start going out, it starts curving down. That's a pattern that you would only notice if you tested a really large number. Or maybe when you go negative, instead of being double, it's more like double but absolute value. So this is an idea I would call relevant factor analysis. You want to determine what affects the result, and if you don't know, then test that. You want to make predictions about what does and doesn't matter. Does the magnitude of the number matter? Does the type of the number? Does the sign of the number matter? Does the color of the box matter? Does the size of the box matter? Does the size, shape, gender, or personality of the person matter? These are the things you want to test. For a related science example, let's look at gravity. So, we observe some kind of force between two objects, and from every observation we have ever seen, the force follows this formula. And we have seen many, many examples of this being true. How many tests do we really need to feel confident in this theory? Well, that's not the, exactly the right question. It's not the number of tests we need. It's the number of factors that we can cover. So again, you want to test the relevant factors. Test anything that might cause the results to be different. So here are some ideas I came up with off the top of my head, but maybe gravity behaves differently uh, according to the speed of the objects. Say you want to test objects moving like hundreds, thousands, millions of times faster, or objects spinning way faster or way slower, and see how gravity behaves in those cases. You want to test different locations in space, maybe. Test the other ends of the universe. Maybe there's something way out there, and gravity actually behaves differently way out there. We just can't actually see it. <laughs> so, and you want to test maybe different points in time. Maybe there's something happening over time. So, at the beginning of time, did gravity still behave the same way? Will it still behave the same way a million of, a million years into the future? And maybe there's other things. So, if no matter how many tests you have, no matter how many examples you have of it being true, you don't want to believe it's always true unless you feel like you've been able to cover every possible factor that there is. So, given how hard it is to experiment with some of these things, we can't actually directly observe the beginning of time or the other ends of the universe. Or maybe, I don't know how well we can test really large ob objects moving at much different speeds. If we can't test all of those things, we want to say, well, the theory could still be flawed because we haven't been able to test all of these different factors. So I want to emphasize it's not the number of conf confirming tests that we want to focus on. It's the number of factors that we can cover with our tests. Now, this final theoretical example isn't one I came up with. This is an example from a Veritasium video, and I'll provide the link in the description. And you can watch it there, because they do a good job of it. But I'll just explain the idea and some thoughts about it. So, let's say we have, we have some unknown rule, but that rule applies to a sequence of three numbers. And so, if there's a sequence of three numbers, it either follows the rule or it doesn't follow the rule. And to start out with, we'll say we know 2, 4, 8 follows the rule. So now, your goal is to try to figure out what the rule is, and you can test more sequences 
So you can give another sequence that you're curious about and get an answer of whether or not it follows the rule. So it is the second number is double the first and the third number is double the second. Is that a good guess for all the sequences that follow the rule? Well, there's nothing wrong with it, but <laughs> so it's not a bad guess. Now let's test to see if it's correct. Now when testing this theory, is 3, 6, 12 a good test? It's not a bad test. There's nothing wrong with that test either. So, no, it's, I mean, yes, it is a good test. No, it's not, nothing wrong with it. Now, given that 2, 4, 8, 3, 6, 12, 4, 8, 16, 5, 10, 20 all follow the rule, can we be confident that our theory is correct? Not yet. And that's because the theory is actually making two claims. If you know the idea of if and only if from mathematics, that's the same thing. So there's two sides to it. When we make this theory about what the rule is, we're trying to make two claims at once. The first one is that all doubling sequences follow the rule. So if all of these cases follow the rule, we can be pretty confident that the first claim is correct. I mean, you still might want to do like in the points on a graph example and do like really large numbers, negative numbers, decimals, things like that. But you can be fairly confident that it seems like number one is true. What about the second claim? The second claim you're making is that all non-doubling sequences don't follow the rule. If this isn't true, the rule you came up with might just not be useful at all because it doesn't match the truth very well at all, which is the actual case in this example. So you want both claims to be true, and you want to test that both claims are true. Now when you test, you want to test in the ways that you can be wrong. So with your two claims, there's two clear ways to be wrong. The first one is not all doubling sequences follow the rule. So you would test other doubling sequences to make sure they don't break the rule. That's what we did here. Then you want to test that other sequences that aren't doubling sequences also follow the rule because if that happens, our second claim is wrong. So when you want it, in order to test that, like I said, for the first one, you would test other doubling sequences. For the second one, you would test sequences that aren't doubling, like 2, 3, 4, 8, 4, 2, 2, 4, 7, anything like that. So... If you're curious about this problem being shown to real people, you can watch the video and I'll give a link. Now for some real world examples. Um, this isn't an actual study, but it's very similar to what a, a lot of studies are like. So let's say you do a study and people who slept six hours a day in the study felt worse than people who slept eight hours a day. So therefore you conclude people should sleep eight hours a day. Is this a good conclusion? It's okay, but you want to think about where it might be wrong. So are there any exceptions in the study that show where it's wrong already? Because if there's some people who sleep six hours a day and feel better, that's giving you some examples of where you're wrong already. And you can start to look at what was different for those people and come up with an idea of maybe there's a missing factor. What What is it? Now, something else could be like, could it be fine if it's a gradual transition? 
maybe everyone in the study normally slept eight hours a day, but then for the study, they all of a sudden went from eight straight to six. But maybe if you went from like eight to seven hours and 45 minutes to like seven hours, 30 minutes and slowly worked your way down, it would be just fine. So that's another thing that isn't tested in this hypothetical study. And it's something that you would want to test before you feel too confident about the conclusion. Now, this is something that I think <laughs> is really big and really interesting. So I'm calling it the other side of selection bias. Most people, I would say, kind of understand what selection bias is even if you're not actually a statistics person, if you aren't really a math person, you probably have heard of the idea and understand the idea. So the way it works is if we do a statistical experiment, it might be affected by how we select samples or how we select people to participate in the experiment. So for testing people, and all the people we test are guys in their mid-twenties, the results might not apply to everyone. It might only apply to guys in their mid-twenties, because that's what we tested. So we didn't do a proper random test over the whole population. Now, there's a direct other side to that statement, as this. The results from a perfectly random test across the whole population may not apply to any subgroup or to any individual. So let's say we did a perfectly random test. It covered the entire population. It was perfectly random. Well, the results we get from that might not apply to guys in their mid-twenties <laughs> because this is a, uh, this is an experience. Um, the results we got were from everyone, but maybe there's some bias with guys in their mid-twenties and they're actually different than everyone else. Same goes for any individual. Like, even though this was a test that covered every the whole population, for any single individual, they might be different than the rest of the population or they might be different than the average in some way, and so the results might not apply. So for a more realistic ex example of this, let's say we did a hypothetical random test of schools, and a new teaching method has had a higher success rate than an old teaching method, and the difference was statistically significant. Well, that doesn't actually mean that the new method will work better at any specific school or for any specific individual. So, for an example of that, it could be that the new teaching method is better for extroverts, but worse for introverts. And overall, there are more extroverts than introverts, so overall, when you do a random test of all people, you're going to see that the new method that works better for extroverts is better because overall there are more extroverts than introverts. But for a single individual who might be an introvert, you're actually making them do worse by giving them the new method. Or for any specific school, maybe one specific school happens to have a lot more introverts than extroverts, suddenly they're going to do worse with the new method. And that's going to be because you didn't figure out the, the major factors. You didn't figure out why. What was the relevant factor? In this case, it's personality. And if you knew the relevant factor, you could tell every single person what's the best method for each of them and have something that works best for everyone. Now here's a science example. Even if you're not into physics or science, you have probably heard about dark matter. 
even if you haven't, this first sentence is going to sum it up. So, dark matter is something that we know exists because our observations of the universe don't match our theories of gravity. So we know there's something out there that's messing it up. Now, really, if you can think of this without any bias, <laughs> with a clearer mind, it would sound kind of silly. Because what it's actually saying is, we believe our old theory was so correct that even though we're seeing observations showing that the theory is actually wrong, we're assuming that there's invisible things there that can't be felt, seen, heard, smelled, anything. It's There's just invisible stuff there that's making there in order to make our <laughs> theory correct, because we know our theory is correct, and something's wrong with the observations. That's, like, <laughs> for me, that just seems so crazy. Like, just seems like terrible science. You don't want to have a strong belief and assume that it's true and hold on to it so strongly that one, you see something that goes against it, you immediately say something is wrong with the observation instead of being wrong with the actual theory. But this is kind of how it is. People believe the theory so strongly that even though we can observe situations where the theory is wrong, we assume it's invisible particles that can't be detected. I don't think that's a good thing. <laughs> and here's another quote. It's thought to account for approximately 85% of the matter in the universe. So in other words, our theory is 85% wrong. But we still believe that it's absolutely correct. And the only reason it's wrong is because invisible stuff is out there in order to make our theory correct. I just don't think that's good science. Now, something I really want to talk about is about being wrong. So when I say something is wrong, or when, so when a theory is wrong, that doesn't mean it's, it's bad, it's dumb, it's stupid, or unusable. That's not what that means. So I don't want people to think I'm saying like, yeah, the people who came up with that idea are stupid. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but what we should do is we should accept that the theory is wrong and we should try to pursue a better answer. That doesn't mean throw away the old theory, ignore it, uh, just talk about how bad it is. It's more like build on it. Understand that's wrong but use the parts that were correct from it and build a better theory with that in mind. But you do want to have the mind, correct mindset where you don't want to just get stuck and say, well, not, like, this must be right. You've got to focus on, like, if you see something that makes the theory wrong, how can you explain it? Um, how can you use it to improve the theory? Not how can you explain it away to make your current theory still be correct. So like I said, being wrong isn't bad. It's not, you're not stupid if you're wrong. It shouldn't be something to be embarrassed about. Um, when you're trying to make progress, in theories, it's more about like taking a best guess, figuring out where it's wrong because it's probably going to be wrong. Then you take in the new information, make a better guess that's still probably going to be wrong. Then you try to find more information that shows where it's wrong and then make a better guess and repeat. And again, things that are wrong can still be very useful. So, it might be wrong, but it might be a good approximation. 
It might be useful in certain situations. It might be something that you can use to build the next theory. But I feel like I can't emphasize it enough. You should be wary about sticking too strongly to a single belief. And you don't want to have the mindset of, like, this is always true. And then when counterexamples come up, you just explain them away or ignore them or try to argue just how the old ideas is always true because you can see examples of it being true. That's not what you want to do. You want to figure out anything that might be wrong and use it to improve. So I want to talk about some myths. This is actually a really small list <laughs> and you have a huge list of myths but here are some that I've heard of like I've heard about the tongue and taste map where you know one part of your tongue tastes sweet things and one part tastes sour things and I don't remember the areas exactly but I remember the idea apparently that's not true now people accept it as a myth I've heard of the idea that humans only use 10% of their brain. Apparently, that's not true either. Drinking eight glasses of water a day, apparently that's not actually beneficial to you. Now, the lipid hypothesis. This was something I heard from someone studying meth medicine. And so there's this idea that decreasing cholesterol reduces heart disease risk. Apparently, a lot of people actually believe that's a myth nowadays, and even reducing saturated fat reduces heart di disease risk. Apparently, that's a myth, too. Or, at the very least, a controversy. So, you can look it up on Wikipedia or just anywhere else on the internet, but I'll read what it says. It says, most medical... Scientific, heart health, governmental, and professional authorities agree that saturated fat is a significant risk factor. However, some analyses have provided evidence against the recommendation, including a critique by scientists and one by a trade association. So, I think what I would say I think you're seeing is that people are having trouble going against the things that they've believed for so long. So they're continuing to point at, like, the positive examples. So if it's a, if I go back to something like this, it would be like, if we said, now it's not true that all boxes contain the same thing because we open some blue ones and they have something different. But then people say, now all boxes have to con contain the same thing because we've opened a million, billion, trillion boxes and they've all had the same thing. So whatever your evidence is must not be correct. There must be a problem with your study or something like that. But you can't prove that something is always true using positive examples of it. But you can prove that something isn't always true with one negative example. So I believe that's kind of something that you're seeing where it's just a belief that people have so strongly ingrained that even though you start to find evidence to the contrary, people have trouble accepting it. Another myth is there's some percent daily value myths. And there's an interesting article I found entitled What Doctors Don't Know. And it's actually really old, but I think it's very relevant. So I'm going to read just some passages from it. So, people, doctors included, have a tendency to see what they expect to see. If it makes sense that a treatment will work, 
than a doctor will, with alarming and disheartening reliability, perceive that it does in fact work. So, people have a belief, they start to use positive examples and believe it more strongly, believe that's working. And the person writing the article says that um, when, when they started practicing medicine, the observation had been made repeatedly that women who happened to take estrogen were less likely to have heart attacks and strokes. And so he would give that advice to women. And he was told that in med medical school that that's a good thing, a good recommendation to make. Then in 1998, the results of a formal placebo-controlled clinical trial were published, and it showed that estrogen did not prevent heart attacks or strokes, and in fact, it made women more susceptible to blood clots. And this study astonished most doctors. And if you go farther down, the data was so surprising that many healthcare providers seem not to believe them. So this is the whole idea I keep emphasizing is that people use positive examples to create a belief, and then they hold that belief so strongly that even one you start to see things that make it seem not actually true. They kind of ignore it, kind of say, well, no, it's still true. There's probably something wrong with the things that are saying it's not true. And that's what I'm saying is bad reasoning. You don't want to do that. <laughs> and there's, there's more here. Um... Not sure if I have anything else I want to read from it, though. So, the real big things that I think are worth remembering are, you want to know which side of an absolute statement is easy to prove. And so, it's easy to prove that an absolute statement isn't true. It's hard to prove that it is true. So something you'll see when people are arguing is, Sometimes one person won't get it, and they'll say something like, This is always true. And then someone else says, No, it's not always true. Here's an example of it not being true. And then the first person says, No, it is always true. Here's an example of it being true. Now there's a problem with that, because you can't prove an absolute statement with an example. You can prove that an absolute statement is false with only one example. You can't do it the other way around. So you want to know which side is the easy side to prove. You really want to be wary of positive confirmation. So just because you see something that makes your idea seem true, that's not enough to believe that it's always going to be true all the time. You want to test where it might be wrong. You want to look for factors that you might not have considered. People often stick too strongly to the first plausible theory. So, if there's some complicated thing going on, and no one can explain it, no one knows how it works, and then one person gives a plausible theory, and it sounds really good, a lot of times people will just believe it too strongly, and it'll be so hard to change their mind, they're like, that's it, that's the answer. Look look at all the reasons why that's the answer. And then they stop looking at the things that show why it might be wrong, and they use too much positive confirmation where they say, look at all these things that make this answer correct, and then they just believe so strongly that the answer is correct that even if you see like 85% of stuff out there makes it wrong, you explain it away through invisible particles or stuff like that. <laughs> now, a lot is my belief that a lot of things are wrong, 
And again, wrong doesn't necessarily mean bad. Wrong doesn't mean stupid. Wrong doesn't mean can't be used. But a lot of things are wrong, and there's probably a lot of room for improvement. Like, these are, look at all these myths that people believe in, but they're actually wrong. <laughs> and what I believe is that if people can't learn this way of reasoning and can't use it, you're just going to keep increasing this list of myths. There's going to be even more. So, actually, I have a story to tell about the medical student who told me about the lipid hypothesis and how nowadays people actually consider it a myth. And then he told me how sugar is the real killer. It's really sugar. Sugar does all these bad things. It causes all these health problems. There's all of this positive confirmation for why sugar is terrible. And then I really wanted to just really, um, really point out how I, was, I believe he was doing the same thing, where I bet the people who came up with the lipid hypothesis saw a whole bunch of positive evidence for it. Like, they probably saw a whole bunch of stuff that made them really believe honestly that cholesterol relates to heart disease, saturated fat relates to heart disease. And then they followed the positive confirmation and created the lipid hypothesis and then held to it really strongly. And it sounds like the same thing is happening with sugar. Well, there's all this positive confirmation. There's all this positive evidence to show why it seems like it's really bad for you. But that's not what you want to believe strongly in. You want to believe it because you've looked at all the ways it could be wrong. So there isn't anyone out there who can eat a lot of sugar and be okay. That never happens. There isn't any counterexample of any, in any way. You want to know, have you covered all the factors? Have you looked at all the different ways it could be wrong? Not all the ways it could be right. So this is something that I feel like science and medicine and just people in general don't really do well. And if it keeps going on, you're going to keep getting more of these myths. That's what, what I really want to emphasize. But I would also say it's not easy. So it might be easy to talk about the idea. It's not easy to actually do, and it takes a lot of practice. So like I said here, sometimes there will be things that really seem wrong. Like you're like, oh, I see the flaw in that theory. But actually, it's not wrong. It can be very difficult where <laughs> you can have things that really seem right, but they aren't right. Or things that really, like people believe they're right, but you look at it and you're like, oh, it really looks wrong because of this reason. But it's not wrong. It's very difficult. And the other point I made earlier is I don't think people are ever taught anything like this. So you can't really expect them to be good at it. Now, like I do with all the theories I come up with, I thought about a lot of counterpoints. So one big one is that many people seem to solve really tough reasoning problems without using this mindset. So I've had, I created this reasoning game for testing some ideas and then I shared it with someone and they didn't really seem to have this mindset down but they solved all the problems so what does this mean is this approach incorrect is it not useful is it missing something is it just wrong maybe it's definitely needs some investigation around this are the people who can solve these types of problems without using this mindset? 
Are they actually using this type of reasoning, just not consciously? Maybe. Is there an idea of conscious reasoning versus intuition or instinct, where, like, you can't really, feels like you can't really teach someone to have good instinct, good intuition, but this type of conscious reasoning, I believe, is something that you can teach someone how to do, so you can give them a, like, step-by-step -step process to follow, and then they can reason out a tough problem without the magical instinct, without any kind of born intuition or something like that. These are things that would need to be investigated behind this idea. Another counterpoint is, even when people are using this approach of trying to figure out where things might be wrong, creating a better theory, sometimes people can't really solve the tough reasoning problems, and a lot of times it's because it's so complex, there's a lot of different pieces you have to remember and pull together. So is there something else more important, like working memory or recall? Maybe there is. Finally, and this slide jumps into a whole nother topic, but many things that seem like reasoning problems aren't always reasoning problems. For example, research. Is research about finding the correct answer, or is it about finding an interesting answer, or a little bit of both? Or is it about following established procedures, following rules? Is it about convincing other scientists that the research you're doing is worthwhile and correct? Is it about getting published? <laughs> is it about all of this stuff? Is it actually about finding the correct answer, or is it something else? There are many things that are about convincing other people, like if you're trying to sell a product, you don't necessarily have to have the best product, you just need to be able to convince people to buy it. Or research, I believe, can be like that, where it doesn't have to be correct, it just has to be good enough that people are interested in it, or people believe in it, or stuff like that. And a lot of times, when you're trying to convince someone, it's more important to just be able to find a way to say that you're right. You don't actually have to be right, and you don't actually have to find the right answer. You just have to say something that gets people to be convinced. And I'd say... In the long run, as people are less easily convinced, things are going to have to be more accurate. So, if everyone just believes every study that says, well, got a statistically significant result that A is better than B. If everyone just believes that, then that's good enough for the study's sake. Supposing it's more about, like, finding an interesting answer than finding a correct answer. But if people start to ask questions like, well, is it really true? Is it true for me as an individual who might be different from the rest of the group? Is it true for my subgroup that might be different from the group as a whole? As people start to be less easily convinced things are going to have to be more accurate. So that's the end of this video. I hope you found it interesting. Also, I'm going to be open to discussing some of the ideas on the Discord that I linked in the last video. I'll link it in this video, too. Thanks for watching.